Just fine. Good. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Good. Still too early, 8:30 on a Saturday. Well, um, welcome to DataCon LA. Uh, it is August 13, 2022. My name is Dimas, and we have our co-host here, Bob, and we're excited to bring you the DataCon LA 2022. This year, particularly, will be extra special because it is the 10th anniversary of DataCon LA. Give it up to DataCon LA 2022, guys. <clears throat> so a little bit of history. Um, you, did you know that DataCon LA began as the Big Data Camp LA in 2013? with only 250 attendees. It rebranded itself to Big Data Day LA, and it grew to 1,500 attendees. In 2018, the conference became what we know now, the DataCon LA, and had over 2,000 attendees pre-pandemic. What's impressive is that even during the pandemic, it still attracts thousands of virtual attendees. So this is a testament to the dedication of Sebash, our founder of this conference, the volunteers, the sponsors, and of course, you guys, the attendees. And so give yourselves a round of applause. Hello. Um, today we have a day full of fun and learning. Um, the talks are all about data organized in the six different tracks. You may have seen this, a data science one track, data engineering, a data infrastructure and security, emerging tech, data for good, and uh, BI reporting use cases. We have keynotes we'll be presenting on this stage shortly. We have talks, panels, and tutorials in half a dozen locations around campus. We've selected the most compelling and up-to-date content for you. So take advantage of networking with the best people in the data world today. This is the largest data conference in Southern California. So welcome, everybody. All right, thanks, Bob. So we want to make sure that you guys are all learning and networking within a safe environment. So let's take care of each other. We recommend wearing your masks whenever it's possible. Um, some of you might already received your water bottle. So please use it. Um, uh, we have water refill stations around the campus. It's going to be hot today. Keep yourself hydrated. This year, we won't be serving lunch uh, like in previous years due to the pandemic-related requirements. So, however, we have uh, USC Village and Seeds Marketplace, um, and then uh, we will have a complimentary coffee in the afternoon at the Alumni Park. Okay, so now that that housekeeping is out of the way, I'm sure you're ready to get this party started. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker, Sohail Katal who has more than 20 years of experience in both public and private sectors. As CIO of the second largest school district in the US, Sohail oversees the largest technology environment in the nation with over half a million, half a million students and employee devices accessing a network of nearly 100,000 wireless access points daily and 30,000 miles of cabling and 16 petabytes of storage. So under his leadership, Los Angeles Unified School District has completed the first infrastructure modernization program, has implemented the first student-centric data analytics program based on the whole child framework, and implemented the first ever real-time live dashboard for the student's home connectivity experience during the pandemic, which contributed to multiple programs for the county, the city, and the state. And he's just getting started, so please extend a warm welcome to Sohail Katal. Good morning, DataCon LA, and appreciate for the time that provided for me. I really uh, proud to be here to share my experience with this group of uh, enthusiastic people for the data. So, uh, some time ago, I was uh, reflecting on my past experience uh, and my career across the information technology. Going back to 80s, I recall the whole 
of our effort was about producing data because the data, the way that exists right now, didn't exist as much. So probably data analytics didn't exist to the level that it exists today. So I remember how I started being a programmer. Yes, you wanted to analyze the data you needed to code. Yeah, COBOL <laughs> and any other language programming that you know. Then came about the amazing spreadsheet like Lotus, Excel, and revolutionized, put the data in the hand of everybody to be able to analyze it. And nowadays, multiple analytic tools that they can join, merge, modify, and present the data the best way as possible exist all across, and we're all using it today. Something is important about data. And when you look at the data by itself, is like looking at the nature. It's something that need to be brought to the face for the people to be able to understand and communicate with. And the way that I'm portraying it, I'm looking as a data scientist or the data analyst like an artist, because it's not just a science. You look at it, you need to pick the right colors, mix them and create a vivid picture that your data consumer can understand and relate to. If you hand over the data the way it is to the consumer, uh, depending on the skill that they have, they may or they may not have uh, received what you wanted to communicate with them. And exactly like an artist, when you are painting your data visualization, your dashboards, and whatever you're creating, that shows them what you want them to see. So with that, um, in Los Angeles Unified, we started our uh, experience with the data and analytic back in 2000. That's where we created our first decision support system, DSS. That was the phrase those days. I, you know that every time there is a catchphrase, comes with the data, comes with the information technology, and that was the phrase. Even nowadays, a lot of people using it. But yes, DSS was a system that would allow us to be able to analyze and process the student data and be able to come up with some uh, projection about the enrollment, attendance, and everything else. So, what I'd like to share with you, the roadmap that we had from DSS until today, it wasn't straightforward, it was a curvy road, as you see. There was a lot of ups and downs as we were creating these platforms. We started with the DSS back in 2000. We grow to a more advanced system. We called it My Data. Now we put the data in the hand of the teachers with My Data. That was the first ever experience in K-12. Yes, in higher ed, there was experience with that. But in K-12, it was the first time that the teacher could analyze the student data. And I'm not talking just look at the student data. I was talking about analyzing it. Eventually, we grow to more modern system, get data and everything else. I'm not gonna bother you with that, but when I joined LA Unified back in 2016, it was the start of the revolution of uh, processing those data in the most meaningful way for everybody to be able to consume. We came with the open data dashboard, put the data in the hand of the public. We came with the whole child framework because all of our data was about accountability for the schools. That was a time that we always wanted to compare ourselves with other school districts across the country, even per school, compare one school against another school. But we never focused on the source of the data, which is a student. That's where we wanted to focus. That's what the whole child framework was adopted by the LA Unified. If you know about whole child framework, um, it is five criteria around the student that shows a student performance is not all academic. It's not just attendance, it's social, emotional, it's health, it's safety. And when you look at it, you say, how you quantify that data? Yes, you can quantify all of that data. Some of these are structured, some of them are unstructured data. Depending on how you capture it, you can see and analyze those data. A couple of weeks ago, actually, we had a discussion how we can really uh, evaluate if we put a program for student health and human services across our district, if that program is functioning and working and improving the well-being of the student. 
It's as simple as that. We have half a million students. All of the data being centralized, whatever they search, whatever they use in their computer, can be filtered through our filtering systems. So we could analyze those data without identifying any student information and just find out if the students are in the best state of their life. And this system exists for years, it's not new, but how we are using it, how we put this data around the student that created the whole child framework. It was a unique experience. So this was before pandemic and when we got through the pandemic, we had the infrastructure for that data set. And that's where pandemic created the, I probably hate to say that, created the opportunity for us to be able to use that experience to identify the gap that is in the student instructional when they were remote, when they were not in the school anymore, they were not in the campus. Teacher couldn't share anything with me about them properly because they were remote as well. So we came up with more advanced technology to be able to capture those data. Most of those data, as I said, was on a structure. We pulled the data from Zoom analytic. You know that during the pandemic, everybody was using Zoom. Pulling that data, how student experience with Zoom. Pulling the data to find how they're connecting through their internet. Are they dropping from the class? Are they absent? Although the, re the report for absenteeism would come through the, our SAS system, but our focus was, is what the teacher showing as an attendance is a real attendance or assignment being done by the student. That's where we were able to capture all of that. And ultimately, we were able to see if the student even have, they have a proper bandwidth and connectivity to be able to uh, continue with their education. That's where we started the Digital Divide Initiative. The Digital Divide Initiative was for us to be able to consume and capture that data, identify the quality of the services student is receiving, and categorize it based on the different demographics. Demographics that we had it from our SIS data for half a million students across the city. It was unique in a way because no other agency or organization had a single source of data across the city that can daily monitor half a million consumer and identify based on all the demographic that I said, what that person, that household is experienced. That's where this project was successful for us because not only we could target the student that they needed help, you could do a lot of analytics around it. We identified what percentage of a student living in the low income category band for us. We identified, despite all the discussion that was before pandemic, the internet didn't exist in the city of LA that we expected to see. Our data showed that. We could see that we, we mapped the data through the heat map. We were able to identify where are the hotspots. And it was obvious. It was Southeast LA, it was all the way to San Pedro. It was north in Panorama City. So those data was eye-opening for the, our partners in other agencies because we were biggest sample data that they could collect. Again, we're living in the city and you have half a million data with ultimate accuracy that could tell you what are we experiencing across with the student connectivity. And obviously this dashboard, uh, and analytic data also showed us why and how those students were not connecting. Therefore, they couldn't receive the proper instruction. We came up with the action to close it. And those uh, action involved putting a strategy to come up with the connectivity pro uh, projects, come up with the devices and everything else, which is logistical. And this project still continues until today. We're still collecting those data. We didn't stop. And we are sharing with uh, federal agencies like, such as FCC to be able to come up with the new norm for educational usage. And that's where um, our data helped the FCC to increase the bandwidth utilization for educational use. And I'm not talking just K-12. From 25 megabit per, per second standard that they define in their program to 100 megabit per second after they saw our data. So, 
our data the story doesn't end here. This is what we did so far. But uh, another thing that we did during the pandemic, we realized our legacy systems are not sized enough to handle that amount of data we were processing. That's we modernized and moved to the cloud platform embedded technologies such as the Snowflake and other uh, data streaming platform to be able to get the data as fast as possible and as reliable as possible to hand, uh, to hand, to hand over to our uh, data consumers, which were local district, there were school, there were administrator and the teacher. Now they all can analyze our data for everything in a matter of minutes rather than waiting for two days for us to process the data. So um, in the future, we are looking for more um, AI implementation to make the data more um, usable for our consumer. And hopefully we can take a, a more futuristic approach by adding NLP and other technology that make a narrative for the teachers rather than they be able, rather than them deciphering the data on their own. So with that, I think that was our story. It was short. I want to make sure that um, we share with the public. And again, if any one of you willing and wanting to share and collaborate with us, our open data has all of our data. You can pull it, you can play with it. And we love you to share your experience with us and help us to help our students. Thank you. Just leave that <clears throat> Thank you, Soel. Our next guest is Lakshmi Sharma. She is currently the Chief Product and Chief Strategy Officer at Fastly, a global programmable edge cloud platform designed to help enterprises and developers extend their core cloud infrastructure closer to users. Before Fastly, she was the Director of Product Management for Networking in Google Cloud. She also led products and engineering at Cisco, Brocade, RIFT.io, Absera and Target. Lakshmi is passionate about building inclusive and transparent organizational cultures where everyone feels supported in their growth and empowered to make an impact in the organization. In personal life, she believes education is the best way to bring equality. Please welcome Lakshmi Sharma. Hello, everyone. Okay, working. Um, hi, everyone. You heard about me. So um, I'm going to talk about internet. I'm going to talk about how internet works. Maybe you all know. I will add a little bit to that knowledge. But I will talk about a little bit details about uh, what happens when you type a URL into, in, you know, into your browser. What happens when you bring up an app? What are different components? Network components, security components, what, what all those components are. And in that story, I will, uh, you know, I will put in my company, which is Fastly, um, which is an edge cloud company. Um, so with that, I will start with that. So a little bit about Fastly. So who is Fastly? Hmm. You can't read this, right? <laughs> it was supposed to have some animation. So Fastly's vision is to enable a secure, engaging, and really fast internet experience. So what does that mean? Anything that sits on internet, like how when you want to, let's say you want to bring up a website, you want to bring up an app, and especially like past two and a half years, like when we all are connected to internet, you really want things to be fast. And you're also worried. You're also worried. Am I giving all my data? Where is my data secure? Where is it secure? Who's touching it? So let me take you through a little bit of journey of who touches it, where it goes. And in that story, we'll talk a little bit at the end about what data privacy means in this world of internet, internet security, and distributed components. So uh, this is Fastly. Fastly started 10 plus years ago, uh, went public like three plus years ago. So the founders of the Fastly, uh, the time when they were building, they needed, they were all developers. So they wanted to build their applications for internet. Internet was coming up and then it was just growing really, really fast. When you put, they would put something, uh, um, they would deploy an application, let's say, uh, I'll take an example of 
Lakshmi's bank. So if, if I wanted to build a Lakshmi's bank application and put it onto internet and have everybody on internet, you know, just go access it. And then let's say Lakshmi's bank want to partner with say some, uh, some third party ATM uh, vendors who want to run my ATM around the globe. If I wanted to enable that, for all those ATM providers in the world, let's say then there are these micro loan companies in Asia, in South America, they wanted to kind of partner with my Lakshmi's bank. How would you do that? This is, and I'm talking about speed, which is 10x, 100x, like talking about like every year, number of developers growing, number of kind of internet users growing. How would you, how would somebody have done that speed of deployment, speed of access, speed of delivery, and then while doing all of that, designing a very globally distributed system that people can attach to with really kind of single click of a button. It did not exist. Cloud is emerging, you know, development, developers as a, you know, as a fancy and very respectable kind of persona was emerging. DevOps, DevSecOps, a lot of, lot of these things. But then there was no infrastructure. There was no cloud platform. There was not that ring that could collect, connect the globe for Lakshmi's bank to build applications them to connect all these micro loan companies and different parts of the world. These ATM vendors, all they want to do is like white label to Lakshmi's bank. So they didn't exist. So that's what this company built a globally programmable edge where they can deploy. People can build their applications, software defined throughout the globe. So this, there are certain numbers. Let's just pick number 215 terabits per second. Capacity throughout the world like 1.5 trillion requests served every day. We are talking about a global capacity. This is still like, you know, it may not sound really big number to some of you, but these are really big numbers when you're talking about, uh, you know, users. What does the life of an internet looks like? So when you type something, what happens? It, you say, you know, www, www means www.lakshmibank.com slash uh, ATM or slash microloan. It goes and it translates into something, which a DNS, uh, that's a security and network component that resolves, that sits into your internet, what means AT&T, Verizon, depends on what service you have. Then it goes to something called point of presence. That's where like, you know, this is a traditional way, then some security will happen that will send it to something else. And then another pop, depending on where your data sits. Say Lakshmi's bank, let's say, applications and data is sitting maybe like, you know, uh, East Coast or somewhere in Europe and maybe in India. So it will take you all the way there. So imagine how many talk components we are talking about. How many places are, do we have to touch security? So uh, what the first wave of things or the innovation happened was to converge one pop to second pop to something called DMZ, which DMZ, which protects your data with firewalls and IPsec content, a lot of security things. So something called ZTNA started, which is zero, trust network architecture, which led to another thing called SASE, which is secure access and service uh, design, which is which an edge word came there. So bringing all those three, four hops that you see in to something called edge is where Fastly was building for many years ago. And let's just, I will, for a few seconds, I will take Fastly from this discussion, but remember this now, bringing a lot of these hops around the world into a distributed software framework and what, what does it do? It brings your security into one framework. It brings, it brings your data control in, you know, not so many distributed places. So it makes it easy, right? This is how, while we are talking about data, this from different places, different country regulations, th these are the things that, you know, that help you make it easy. So typical kind of, you know, customer workflow or say user workflow and application workflow. So this red thing in the middle, is what when you look at in the previous slide, it converges three columns, and you can come and bring your firewalls and your rules and policies, data policies, governance right at that place. Makes it really easy. I heard about the power of developers in the previous, you know, with the previous speaker, they talked about like how they were a developer, they had to put these automation and logic to just analyze data. Now imagine power to that excellent kind of global framework of so many capabilities and every developer could go build their own security policy, data analytics policy, all of that. So that's what, what this thing called edge cloud or edge paradigm with zero trust or secure edge or secure processing edge compute brought to the developers. Just quick number, there are like close to 50 million developers this year, like as of the number, two years ago, this was 30 million. So if you had kids like me who are interested in programming and all, that's a great area to be in. So, um, 
So edge, edge what, you know, just kind of redefining. What should edge be? It should be really fast, be anywhere, very easy to access and trusted. What all do you need at that? And you need something called app, right? Application, we are talking about application, what you call app, app protection. It has to be developers friendly, as I talked about. The only way to kind of, you know, go really fast, whether it is data analytics, whether it is like, a, you know, security, whether it is compute, whether it is storage, whether it is databases, you need that fast operationalization of the information or the logics that you have or the business logic that all needs to happen fast. So there are these kind of, you know, there are a lot of tooling and there are a lot of kind of integration happening through different, uh, say, new personas and new roles or new companies who are investing into DevOps, DevSecOps. That is all about kind of bringing these multiple components together. But you need to be protecting it everywhere, right? How do you protect? When we say protect, there are multiple things. Authentication, authorization, uh, policies of that country, like, you know, what, so, uh, and it comes from a user, from the internet coming to their application, which is sitting in some place, let's say a data center or cloud. So you're talking about authentication, authorization through that first set I talked about or a dev builder who's building your application for Lakshmi's bank or the ATM or the micro loan in wherever they are. But then at the end of the day, it's like when it is user's data, you have to be building your design and architecture really, really careful, very careful. So the data privacy, and I'm not using word data security because I'm talking about data privacy. What data can you store? What data can you not store? Where do you store? How long do you store for? for especially like for past four or five years, and since like the cloud became kind of, you know, more an adoption, it has become the requirement for any deployment. So data privacy, and that's what kind of, you know, I will end this presentation with. So there are a lot of, you know, remember, so I'm pretty sure you're all like here because you all love data. You talk about data analytics, ingestion, all those kind of, you know, work around it. But from a cloud perspective, from an edge perspective, privacy and regulations and we, we really work hard on, or as an industry, to look into how we deploy it, how we build the, you know, the uh, privacy, and how we build the infrastructure, how we build the cloud, so that we maintain. And one of the ways in which you do is that don't store data. You know, I'm talking about this, and our data con saying that don't store data. So that you cannot, but no, th this doesn't, this statement doesn't apply to all the places. But when you're edge, you basically say, I will only keep this information for these many microseconds and I'll drop everything off before kind of I even enter into the data privacy and data guidelines. So that's how we are designed, that we don't store data. We just edge, cache, APIs, you know, authentication, authorization, anything that you have, that's how we design. So thinking about data privacy many years ago, that's how the edge paradigm is. Sending, uh, so a lot of companies are working towards it and uh, you know, I, I know I talked about data, not storing data and data con, but it was this is how kind of internet is evolving and internet edge works. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. That was very interesting. Um, so we have our next speaker is uh, Peter Liu. Uh, Peter is the acting chief information officer for Los Angeles County. With over 35 years of public sector IT experience, he serves as principal advisor on it, to the CEO and provides strategy, leadership, and guidance on enterprise IT initiatives, uh, IT governance, and the delivery of IT capabilities. But prior to joining Los Angeles County, Mr. Liu was a director of consulting services at a large multinational firm where he was responsible for the successful delivery of multiple public sector ERP and public health projects at state and local governments. Please welcome Peter Liu. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, as, as, as Bob mentioned, my name is Peter Liu, um, a lifetime uh, public servant with a small stint in between my sandwich career at public, uh, and private sector. What I'd like to do is share with you a little bit uh, uh, the data journey at LA County and, and some of the things that we've done to, um, to build out the capabilities, thank you, to support our, our uh, board priorities as well as emerging social needs um, and also um, some forward-looking things that we are looking to continue to evolve um, our technology. But 
before I start, just to kind of give you a little bit about, uh, about the county of Los Angeles. Uh, we have the largest county um, in the nation. Um, very few people understand what LA County does. You deal with cities, you deal with municipalities. municipalities. The county of Los Angeles is actually the largest employer um, in a county of 4,000 square miles, comprised of 88 cities. LA City being the biggest one, right? Then you've got Long Beach and Pasadena and many of the communities that you live in. But there's also about half the county in geographical area that's comprised of about 120 communities of various sorts. Altadena, for example, is an example of a community, La Crescenta and so forth. So, so you know, the, the sheer size and span of, of LA County is, is makes some of our, 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 um, our problems fairly challenging. So when you look, for example, at a Department of Children and Family Services, it provides foster care and, and, and guardian, and acts as a guardian for over 22,000 youth um, in the County of Los Angeles, providing almost 29,000 social welfare benefits um, to those individuals. Um, and then we also, uh, not a good, good thing, but they also handle close to about 220,000 calls of child abuse and, and neglect every single year. So having to respond to that, they have they use a case wide uh, case management system. That's a case that's a, a statewide system. Uh, Department of Social Services serves almost more than half a million, uh, half the county population, 5.6 million, doling out benefits of almost 470 million monthly to those individuals and providing those services. Probation, right? Supervisors, 72,000 adults um, in LA County as well as 2,800 youths that are being housed in various camps across the county. A sheriff's department, largest law enforcement agency, um, as is also um, uh, very engaged with our community with almost 90,000 arrests that they conduct every year. And they house and manage 14,500 inmates on an average on a daily basis. Um, the housing, the food, the transportation, the security and everything else. Our Department of Mental Health is one of three health departments. Many counties have one health department that deals with all these three things. But given the size uh, and complexities of and diversity of LA County, we have three health departments. One for mental health, which serves over 250,000 clients across 1,000 sites and 300 co-located facilities uh, to attend to the mental health needs at departments, schools, courts, and the jails. Uh, Department of Public Health, unfortunately, has been put into the forefront because of the COVID pandemic. Um, provides 39 programs around communicable diseases as well as, as um, infectious disease management across the county. With the most recent COVID, we served over 3.2 million COVID cases and delivered over 26 million doses of vaccinations across the county. And more recently, with the monkeypox um, endemic that's emerging, it's now becoming a little bit more front and center with public health, trying to respond to also that crisis. Last but not least, our Department of Health Services. Very few people know that the County of Los Angeles runs four hospitals, um, as well as 26 clinics, serving 750,000 patients across the county. So when you look at this as a sampling of this landscape, right? Um, and, and many of these departments have, some of them have modernized systems. Some of them are using, using um, uh, mainframe-based systems. Um, client server based systems, old technologies, data buried in various, in various areas of, of service domains. Um, and then you overlay it with the issue of homelessness, justice reform, child protection and welfare, and health integration. It exacerbates the need for us to really look at ways to begin to tie and connect, if you will, the data that we have in these various repositories so that we can better serve our clients and constituents. Some of the questions that you would come up is, who are our clients? Well, each of these departments have modern systems and know what the clients are, but who are the clients at a county level? One of the things we found out is that half our client population have two or more services uh, across our county departments. Very little information about that. How do we do that? How do we better assess needs? How do we use data to do that? Coordination of care across these different domains um, and how to better understand whether our services are delivering the benefits that we intend to do by assessing client outcomes, right? And then informing us to improve services 
while protecting the privacy and confidentiality. You heard a little bit about privacy from, from Lakshmi earlier, um, the privacy and confidentiality of the information because a lot of the information that we deal with and share in this domain is ruled by HIPAA, uh, welfare infant codes, uh, CGIS, which is the justice data and all the security and privacy around that. So how do we navigate and still be able to better serve our clients? So one of the things we realized as we begin to embark on this journey was the need to be able to connect, right? To be able to connect the different clients from these different domains so that we can better understand more holistically our client and the services they are receiving. And using that information that we can better generate insight in terms of how those services are being consumed, right? How do we measure and improve services based on, on, on the metrics that we establish and drive the outcomes that we want to achieve, right? And then also to be able to use this data, this is a two sides of the coin of the data that we're using in LA County. The second side is to help us do quick care coordination, person-centric, to be able to do intervention services, to divert, to be able to provide better rehabilitation, enabling and coordinating and referring services across these different domains. So very, very simply put, the first thing we recognize was we needed to go ahead and create our ability to connect our clients. So that was the first component of a platform that we build out, is what we call our client master data, right? We're able to draw clients regardless of the systems that they use, mainframe as well as modern, to be able to bring those clients across and be able to resolve it. The result of this effort is we now have in this client master data, over 31 million clients that we have over the last 10 years that we have interacted with. And, and incidentally, it confirmed our suspicions that two thirds of those client population receive two or more services. Now we have an ability to enable care coordination teams to be able to go to this repository, get this information and have a much more holistic view of the clients that they are trying to serve. Similarly, on the service history side, we have over 250 million transa transactional records within this registry of services that we are now better able to understand and be able to complete and understand how our clients are consuming our services. We have the standard ETLs and we create this data management platform. It's an oversimplification of what we have put together in place. But what's important here is we use the same set of data to create two primary domains or zones. One is what we call an enterprise data store where the information is identifiable, right? We know who the individuals are, we know what their PII is and so forth. And we need that information because we need to coordinate care. But then there's also for the analytics and data side, um, we also have something called a data lake that anonymize the same data set and makes it available to our data scientists and the different users of the data to solve um, to better understand our client population, the serve. The goal of that data analytics is to serve up data that is agnostic of platform, right? Because of the diversity of the county and the different technologies we use, we need to be mindful that we cannot impose our departments to use specific data platforms and data tools, but to serve up the data so that they can consume it in the way that, um, that they need to do their business. Similarly, on the services side, we build out a service hub that's able to allow us to do service integration to serve up applications. We now have applications that can provide child, so, child social workers to be able to do safety assessments on their mobile death devices, to be able to find out you know, um, the, um, the domain that they're doing assessments to assess the safety of the child in their environment. We're able to use this information to provide support to homeless outreach teams. So on the mobile devices also that they can be better informed in terms of who they are trying to serve, what services the individual may have received from the county in the past to better inform them on their needs assessment going forward. Looking forward, we're doing several things in here as the wrap up, we're beginning to look at how we can begin to leverage machine learning uh, to inform us, to generate patterns and be more predictive, if you will. We're looking at ways to now identify clients that could be potentially at risk of homelessness before they come, come homelessness so that we can provide intervention services. We're looking at using um, um, the, um, the service engine to begin to collect and manage consent, 
right, consent to share data, right, and so that we can be able to provide the data to the providers and the care coordinators that need the services. Okay, so that's kind of a very quick snapshot of our dirty uh, data journey. Uh, we have lots more to do, uh, but uh, we're really excited that we're in a place that we can begin to build upon what we have and, and leverage it for future, uh, for future users. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. So our next guest is Eva Pereira. She is the Chief Data Officer for the City of Los Angeles, where she oversees the city's open data program. Her team leads the delivery of a wide range of community data projects and is working to launch the city's first ever racial equity site. She's been named a state and local leading data executive by CDO Magazine. Her team is open to collaborating with mission aligned organizations and connecting folks with city data so they can build impactful projects together. Give your warm welcome for Eva. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about some of the really interesting data projects that the city of Los Angeles is working on around racial equity um, in partnership with our chief equity officer. Um, so a little bit about the team. Um, I'm Ava. I'm the chief data officer for the city of Los Angeles. Um, my team manages the city's open data portal. Um, so we host over 4,000 data assets across uh, our Socrata open data portal and our GeoHub, which is our home for geospatial data. Um, and in addition to working on open data, my team also works on projects, data projects for uh, different shops within the mayor's office and also sometimes for city departments. Um, so you're looking at our team who's been working on a lot of the work that I'm going to present today. Um, we have some really amazing data fellows from Coding It Forward and Cal State LA and uh, just want to make sure that they get a shout out as well. Um, and so a lot of the data equity work that I'm going to talk about today is supported by some really great leaders at the city of Los Angeles. So Capri Maddox leads the uh, Civil and Human Rights Department and um, you know her team has been incredibly supportive in some of the projects that we're working on and uh, Brenda Shockley is the city's chief equity officer who's been incredibly supportive as well. Um, so what do we mean by equity? Um, so this is a map of historic redlining in Los Angeles, and it's overlaid with uh, present day poverty rates. So you can see that there's still a significant degree of overlap there. Um, and so when we talk about equity, we mean that race should no longer be able to be used to predict life outcomes. You shouldn't see disparate outcomes by race. Um, so we're hoping to improve outcomes for all groups. Um, so how can data advance equity? Um, so I think of it in terms of four key uh, improvements. Uh, first and foremost, data can be used to improve programs. So for example, let me see. Oh, right, I'm missing some images. <laughs> um, so for example, during the pandemic, we rolled out a program uh, to close the digital divide. So we were distributing Wi-Fi hotspot devices to uh, 18,000 students within the LAUSD system. Um, so one way that we use data to advance equity is looking at broadband connectivity rates by census tract, and then looking at adoption of the program by census tract to see if there are any gaps. Um, so that was very informative in terms of helping us realize where we needed to do more outreach and where you know, the program could be improved. Um, another way that data is used to promote equity is in city services. Um, so transit departments, for example, will frequently look at demographic and socioeconomic data to figure out where they need to expand services. Um, uh, city operations are another area where we're looking at you know, how is, you know, the city of Los Angeles is incredibly diverse. Um, so does the city workforce reflect that diversity? Um, and are we promoting fairly? Um, so that's another er key area that we're looking at. 
Um, and finally, policy change. I think all of these research projects are very um, helpful in changing direction and changing strategy when necessary. Um, so, like I mentioned, I mean, typically the data projects that we worked on that we work on fall into these three categories. Um, so we're looking at resource allocation, where is the need the greatest, um, and how can we route resources to those areas. Um, gap analysis, so you know where um, you know. Where, where are the gaps in the reach of this program? Where could we improve it? Where can we do better? Um, and also just general equity analyses. Um, I am missing some images. Uh, okay, well, I'm just gonna wing it. <laughs> um, so the best practices that um, were supposed to be on this slide were um, a, a series of images. So first and foremost, I would say disaggregate data whenever possible. Um, aggregated data hides a lot of underlying trends that may be happening. And so you'll miss those signals um, if you're just looking at aggregated data sets. Um, so, you know, I'll get to a project later, but, you know, it's very important to disaggregate by race, by gender, by socioeconomic status to see if there are any underlying trends happening. Um, another recommendation that I have is um, to look at the median, not the mean. Um, so in a city like Los Angeles, where you have, you know, vast inequality, um, it's, let's say you're looking at income data, um, you really want to look at the, me the median um, because there's so many outliers that can skew the data. Um, beyond that, I would say in a policy setting, you always want to lead, actually in a business setting too, you always want to lead with insights. Um, so don't hit the policymakers with a bunch of data, give them the takeaways, give them the insights. Um, and finally, you know, I think for any organization, it's important to just promote a data culture, promote data literacy so that everyone knows how to um, work with data and improve the programs and services that they're managing. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a couple of projects that we're working on that I'm really excited about, um, all of which can be found on the open data portal. Um, but one project that recently just wrapped was a uh, an analysis into disparities in mortgage lending in Los Angeles. Uh, so, you know, this is a really interesting area of study for equity because, you know, home ownership is the primary way that households build wealth and transfer it between generations. Um, so, you know, I thought this was a really interesting avenue of study. Um, and the Urban Institute had actually done one at a nationwide level. So I wanted to compare it and see how LA is faring compared to the nation. Um, so we actually pulled some data from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, through the Home Mortgages Disclosure Act. You can get data going back to 2018 on um, who's applying for mortgages and the status of those mortgages, whether they're accepted or denied. Um, so this is the Urban Institute's uh, study on the left-hand side, which we were aiming to replicate. Um, so, you know, basically, I guess nationwide, um, there, there are racial disparities in, in mortgage lending, um, and they're pretty, pretty drastic. Um, I guess the, the silver lining is that in Los Angeles, it's smaller, the gaps are smaller. Um, so I guess we're faring slightly better than the nationwide average. Um, but citywide, you know, white and Asian borrowers had the lowest denial rate at 14%. Um, whereas Black and Hispanic borrowers um, and those of two or more races and also our Native populations had much higher denial rates. So that just speaks to like continuing challenges in uh, you know, building fam family wealth and climbing the ladder. Um, we also broke it apart to look at mortgage denial reasons. So why, what, what are the primary reasons that these mortgages are being denied? Um, and so we found that across all groups, debt to income ratio is the primary reason that these mortgages are being denied um, at over 30% for all groups. Um, the second most common reason was uh, lack of credit history and um, credit score. 
Um, so that speaks to you know some policy and some program interventions that could be promoted. Um, so you know one policy recommendation we thought of was encouraging lenders to improve equity programs, um, potentially expanding state and local down payment assistance programs to help people get their foot on the ladder, um, and also promoting policies that will close the racial wealth gap. Um, so the researchers um, from the Urban Institute and Brookings have uh, advocated for you know, reparations, baby bonds, or wealth and estate taxes. So just some policy ideas there. Um, and so this project and others that um, are on our open data site are going to be housed on a racial equity site, which we're launching in late September. Um, that will be the home for information, data, and resources related to uh, racial equity in Los Angeles. Um, and so if you're interested in these sort of this sort of data um, and city data in general, um, there are two open data sites that I'd love to point your attention to. Uh, one is the GeoHub, that's our home for geospatial data. Uh, we have story maps, dashboards, and apps that you can access there, and that's at geohub.lacity.org. Um, and then you can also go to our Socraga open data portal, which is our home for tabular or spreadsheet type data uh, at data.lacity.org. Um, and there you can find uh, thousands of city data sets, um, filter and download them, and create your own visualizations or connect it to your own apps. So for those of you who are curious about city data and want to do your own analysis and exploration, I really encourage you to check that out. Um, and finally, if you want to collaborate, I encourage you to reach out to me. My name's Ava, like I said, and really excited to work with, you know, mission-aligned organizations and just anyone who's interested in working on city data projects with us. I'd be really happy to speak with you. So thank you all. You can take this back. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Ava. Um, yeah, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Karthik, Karthik Ramasamy. He's the head of data streaming at Databricks. Before joining Databricks, he was a senior engineer at, engin director of engineering at Splunk. And before Splunk, he was a co-founder of a company and CEO of Streamlio, uh, building next generation event uh, processing infrastructure. And at Twitter, he created Twitter Heron, which was open source and used by several companies. He has two decades of experience working, building parallel databases, big data infrastructure, and networking. Karthik has a PhD in computer science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is the author of several publications, patents, and a popular book, Network Routing Algorithms, Protocols, and Architectures. Please welcome Karthik Ramasamy. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's good to be back in uh, person attending conferences and giving talks. So I'll be talking about a new initiative that we started at Databricks called Project Lightspeed. Uh, I'll talk about what is it and why we started it. Um, so let me go over it from an uh, introduction point of view. What is streaming? Uh, stream data processing refers to an uh, paradigm of uh, data processing where data is processed as, uh, as it's being ingested rather than traditional way of uh, querying the data at rest, right? So the data is collected from uh, uh, CDC, from databases, uh, the collection agents running at uh, various places, various uh, machines, and also IoT related devices. Uh, then streaming data land, uh, lands in message bus like Pulsar or Kafka. Uh, I think the slide seems to be flickering. Is there any way to fix this?
sorry about that okay is there any meeting sorry about that we didn't know yeah i tried that it doesn't seem to work so i think they are working on it okay it's on the end not on the laptop end okay so we have to the next slide okay okay um so so the streaming data lands in the uh, message bus like pulsar or kafka from which the streaming pipelines return in spark pick it up and do some kind of uh, additional sort of transformations before feed into a uh, data lake or even powering dashboards let me see if the slide seems to work when you advance to the next slide um so there recently we have been seeing a lot of explosion of streaming uh, uh across the uh, several industry segments and the streaming itself can be applicable for different uh, industrial verticals including financial services which deals with the use of streaming for fraud detection for uh, retail web retail for uh, personalization and the covid-19 response in healthcare and so on so at uh, databricks we have seen a uh, streaming grow leaps and bounds around more than 150% year after year streaming growth we started with a few jobs in 2019 now we are running more than 4 million jobs uh, per day uh, at data breaks so that clearly shows the importance of streaming across the uh, uh, industries so if you are still not uh, looking at streaming you should consider looking at it because your competitors are already looking at it so in the lot of logos using structured streaming on the lake house as which is the product that is offered by databricks uh, it has experienced nanex growth in 3 uh, years so what is like when i joined databricks one of the um, understanding that i wanted to get a handle on is why it is growing fast so when we looked at uh, talk to a bunch of customers and uh, talk to a lot of uh, users like top there are uh, five reasons that came up which is the strong reasons to for the growth of uh, streaming so first is uh, unified batch and streaming apis it allows uh, developers use the same business logic which means essentially the same api whatever the you used for batch and you can turn it on convert it into streaming with uh, just enabling certain configurations so um, the second main reason is fault tolerance recovery the spark structured streaming allows you to do an automatic checkpointing and uh, recover only the failure tasks so which means your uh, whenever the instances fail or processes fail or the nodes fail it uh, picks it up from where it left off very quickly so without uh, having to a programmer or a user having to do explicit work and the third one is it provides high performance throughput we handle at the customer side we handle 14 million events which is close to 1.2 trillion events per day for the most challenging workloads so it can even do more is because uh, spark is a high throughput system and uh, it allows for flexible operations for example you can express your arbitrary logic and operations on the output of a streaming query using a construct called for each batch within spark itself so finally it allows for stateful aggregations and joins along with the watermarks for bounding the states these are the top five reasons why spark structured streaming has been growing a lot so the growth as um, uh, started uh, 
you, the users started uh, using it for new streaming application as the uh, streaming requirements grow. So, uh, one of the examples of new sort of applications that are coming online is uh, proactive maintenance in oil drilling. Uh, then elevator dispatch. Whenever you are stuck in an elevator, when you press the alarm button, the dispatch has to be done very quickly, and it all goes through streaming. Then uh, third one is the tracing microservices, where if you have deployed your operational system using a collection of microservices, uh, you need to trace a particular request along the set of these uh, a graph of microservices to figure out what are the performance issues and any uh, debuggability issues that we can figure it out. So, um, these are the new set of streaming applications that people are uh, using Spark streaming for. And these also uh, expose some of the shortcomings of Spark structured streaming. One is the requirement for consistent sub second latency. The second one is uh, ease of expressing complex processing logic easily with the API itself, for the example, essentially for micro tracing microservices like applications. Then, uh, integrations with the New cloud sources and systems because uh, a movement to the uh, as a movement of enterprises toward clouds accelerate, we need to integrate with more different systems as sources as well as at sinks. So, what we need to do? So, structured streaming needs to evolve to satisfy these new requirements. That's why we started Project Lightspeed, which is the next generation of uh, Spark structured streaming. And Project Lightspeed explores four different pillars or four different areas. And um, one of them first is performance. It should be predictable low latency. We are targeting around reduction in tail latency by up to 2x. Then uh, enhanced functionality. Uh, include new advanced capabilities for processing data with the new operators and easy to use APIs using something called uh, Windows, uh, uh, advanced Windows, asynchronous IO and other APIs. The third one is uh, operations and troubleshooting, simplifying deployment operations and monitoring and troubleshooting so that you can pinpoint uh, uh, any issues when the pipeline is running very quickly as, as soon as possible. The fourth one is uh, improving the connectors and ecosystem uh, for connecting to different uh, sources and sinks and also improve the authentication authorization features. So, I'm going to give a sample about uh, one of each one uh, of uh, those pillars. So, on, for predictable low latency, we did a lot of benchmarking inside uh, Databricks to figure out what are the hotspots. And one of the things that we found out is uh, how, what you call bookkeeping, which is essentially means offset management. So, essentially, like uh, whenever a micro, I, how, how many of you know that uh, Spark uses something called micro batch? No. Okay. So Spark uses some uh, architecture called micro batch. So which means uh, every micro batch is scheduled first and run to completion before the next micro batch starts. So so when the, during the start of a micro batch, we plan what needs to be what records needs to be executed for that micro batch. So that's what called the uh, uh, offset ranges. Essentially, what range of record constitute that micro batch from a message bus like Kafka and Pulsar. The second, uh, once then the micro batch is executed, then the, once the micro batch is executed, uh, when it finishes, you have to checkpoint the fact that uh, this micro batch is done, which is essentially mark batch done, right? These are all forced commit logs, like right ahead logs that are forced into external storage. And that costs a lot of time from a latency perspective, which means you are executing each one of them sequentially, right? Now, that we timed it around 440 milliseconds. So now, so now, uh, when we made it to, to, a, to a, some kind of overlap execution where the storing of uh, persistent offset ranges along with micro batch processing, when you do overlap between them, so the, the time reduced to 120 milliseconds. That is a four or 73 percent improvement in latency, right? So these are the various hotspots that we have figured out on project light spill going to improve the latency to a few hundred milliseconds or less than a few hundred milliseconds. So then um, Python as a first class citizen. So Spark uh, provides a PySpark API on, on which you can do streaming as well. And it has already a lot of uh, Python API that allows you to do DDL operations, input, output, windowing, aggregation, grouping, joins, filtering, and query management, etc. 
but uh, there is a small gap in that API as well, which is what you call as arbitrary stateful processing, which allows you to manipulate your state in uh, Python itself directly, rather than using Scala or Java. So those are the two uh, API that we are adding for Python, so that the Python becomes a first class citizen and you can use uh, streaming for Python itself. And from an improving debuggability perspective, uh, we want to visualize the pipelines as a data flow, as uh, data as data moves from one operator to the other, and provide a timeline view of the metrics for operators, so that when you click on operator, you can see uh, what was processed at time t zero and what was processed at time t one and time t two, etc. And uh, group the operator metrics by executor, because the executor is a, a Spark concept where multiple operators are from different pipelines are running. So how to summarize the metrics by executor level and incorporate source and sync metrics because source and sync systems are different from Spark. So can you pull out the statistics and provide them on a single pan of glass? So that is uh, these four improvements will constitute what we call improved debuggability to spot the problems as soon as we can. So and uh, there are many more things in as a part of Project Lightspeed. If you're interested in Project Lightspeed, uh, type uh, uh, Project Lightspeed Data Bricks. There's a blog that we published in June uh, that has a lot of details about what are the exact features that we are working on. And the Project Lightspeed is work, being worked on open source. If anybody is interested in collaborating uh, with us, reach out to me. And um, so in LinkedIn, I'll be happy to connect with appropriate folks. And uh, so these, here are the tracking JIRAs on the open source. And that's all I have to say. And thanks for listening. Thank you, Karthik. Um, so we have a couple more. Uh, if you guys want to stick around, uh, the next we have Dr. Heidi Oja. She has been an orthopedic clinician in non-surgical care for 18 years, and is the top-sided researcher in the world on direct-to-employer models to proactively reduce claims cost. She founded Aware Health and serves as a CEO and loves learning every day for her team, from her team, employees, and most importantly, from employer executives. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Heidi Ojia. Hi, everyone. Um, I First of all, I just wanted to introduce myself, um, Dr. Heidi, like they had mentioned. I'm just wondering, how many of you in the audience are students? If you could just raise your hands. Okay, and how many represent companies? Okay, it just gives me a sense of who's like other that don't fall into those two categories. Okay, maybe friends and family. All right, thanks so much. So uh, we're a company that gives care for muscle, nerve, and joint pain for companies. So we partner with employers, and we also, on a request basis, provide care for individuals for muscle, nerve, and joint pain. So this is a pretty big problem. It's a $600 billion problem that this much is spent on orthopedic conditions each year. And the most costly types of procedures or surgeries that contribute to this cost. So we're talking about surgeries of the spine, like fusions, wrist sur surgeries, like carpal tunnel syndrome, and many more like joint replacements. And so if your company happens to be self-insured, 60% um, in the US are, and if your company is over 100 employees, you're probably a component of your plan is self-insured. It's the top category of spend, um, second only to payroll. And so it's a huge cost to your company's bottom line. So the thing is, 95% of these surgeries are no more effective than doing nothing. And um, I know this as a clinician because I've been a researcher and I graduated from USC, <laughs> go Trojans. Um, and I've been working uh, to publish and uh, I really have seen in my example so many patients that have had like 10 knee surgeries and are being scheduled for an 11th knee surgery. And it's frustrating to me when I know none of those surgeries were indicated. And so it's really propelled me to do something about it with my company. 
So I work with Jim Jenkins. He's our CTO and he worked at AliveCore, led their engineering team, built a mobile medical device, and together we've built our company together. So this is how it works. The employee logs the problem on the phone. And um, like if we were to partner with your company, the employee would enter our app and schedule on the same day. And this is really important to us because same day care um, is important to accelerate the timeline of recovery. Usually you wait two or three weeks to uh, get specialty care or start a treatment plan. So if you log a problem on our app the same day you have pain, you see an orthopedic clinical specialist in non-surgical care, we use a 3D model to show you your diagnosis. And we assign a customized treatment video to your plan and then also do in-person follow-up until you reach your goals. And this plan arrives on your mobile device and it helps you get better faster. It also decreases lost work time for employees by 10x, and our net promoter score is really high. And on top of all of it, we avoid a potentially unnecessary surgery. So just to kind of connect the dots a little bit, how does decreasing unnecessary imaging result in decreased risk of surgery? This is just an example of somebody named Mike who twisted his knee hiking and he went in to see the orthopod who immediately does a radiograph. It shows bone on bone. Um, and, you know, he has been living with this bone on bone for probably many years, but because it's visual and he sees it, he's concerned about it. And um, the does a series of injections, then it ultimately chooses to replace his knee. And um, I think this highlights the difference between the traditional medical system and aware health because we use backend algorithms to determine who needs imaging, who doesn't, without missing one fracture, one serious condition that we, we would need to image. And so we reduce imaging by, um, we've only imaged 3% of all the cases coming into our app. So, by greatly reducing imaging, we can accelerate recovery and decrease concern and decrease surgical rates for companies. So these are all the companies that we've worked with. And you can see here that in the yellow, it's the cost of those who've used us per member per month. And the green shows the cost of those that are using the insurance-based system. So we're greatly able to accelerate recovery, which is better for the individual because they get better faster, but also greatly decrease cost for the employer. And I would say, you know, for the students out there, um, it greatly decreases cost for you because you don't have to spend that, um, you know, copay deductible or um, co-insurance towards imaging and surgeries. This is another example. We map out the per member per month in two different categories of musculoskeletal. Um, green is the kind of women's health side of musculoskeletal and yellow is the non-women's health side. So with these costs, the spikes that are really high are multiple surgeries that are done for employees of companies for that year. And um, you can see with this particular company as we implemented our service here, we uh, drastically reduced cost when we started to roll it out to all employees. So for this particular company over one year, we're saving $2 million approximately. So we're serving over 2,000 paid members, $240,000 ARR is kind of financially where we're at, and we have $10 million of sales in our pipeline. And we're the only provider right now that diagnosis without imaging. Most people think you need an image if you have pain to find the diagnosis, but we're able to do that efficiently without that. Um, and we're the only ones that prevent chronic pain versus treating it. And we are saving more than double other competitors in terms of cost. So. We are really motivated right now to work with as many companies as we can. And most oftentimes, companies don't feel like they have a musculoskeletal problem 
and every single time they have one when we pull their data. So we are offering a free service to pull your data if you're interested. My email is included here and we'd love to just meet with you over email. If you mention DataCon, we'll do this whole process free of cost. So reach out to me and we'd love to start a conversation. Also students, if you're interested in kind of being a um, beta user in our system and want a free evaluation, feel free to email me as well. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Osher. Um, I'd like to introduce Ron Galperin, who's been a favorite speaker at DataCon LA for several years. Uh, he is the independently elected controller of the city of Los Angeles. He serves as a watchdog for taxpayers at City Hall, making sure public dollars are spent efficiently and effectively. Controller Galperin oversees teams and audits, mun audits municipal, municipal departments, manages payroll and spending, uh, reports on the city's finances and pursues fraud and waste. He launched the city's first open data portal in 2013 and uses data and technology to create a more transparent, accountable, equitable, and modern government for everybody. Please welcome Ron Galper. Good morning, everybody. Is this uh, working? Great. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Ron Galperin. I am a controller of the city of Los Angeles. Sometimes I think I have the most deceptive title of all of the elected officials in the city of LA. Alas, I do not get to control everything. Um, but it is my job to keep the uh, finances of the city in some semblance of control. And uh, I think of it as an aspirational title in terms of how much one does control. But uh, thank you, Subash, and also for DataCon LA for inviting me again to be part of this event. Um, you heard uh, from the county and also from our city's uh, data chief. And as controller of our nation's second biggest city, uh, it's my job to be the uh, taxpayer's watchdog overseeing our finances, our spending, our operations to make sure that public dollars are really serving the four million plus residents of our city, keeping government honest, responsive, accountable, and making sure that it's working internally. Uh, all the money that's paid out in salaries and benefits to all of our city employees, that goes through my office, payments made to our vendors in the billions of dollars a year, to our contractors that the city does business with, that also comes through my office. And we also do financial reporting, forecasting, tracking, we perform financial and performance audits, and we issue reports about what's working and what's not working. Um, as a public official, I see it as my job to make as much information as possible available and accessible to anybody and to everybody who wants it, with a few caveats, of course. Um, it builds awareness, it modernizes, it revolutionizes the way that government operates and help us to come up with creative solutions as we face challenges, everything from climate change to homelessness in Los Angeles and well beyond. And I wholeheartedly believe in the ability of data and technology and innovation to improve lives and communities. I see it as a tool for democracy, actually a necessary tool for democracy, a critical starting point for helping to build trust in government. And let's be honest, people are not feeling very trusting of government these days. And so I believe that open data can help to build and to rebuild that. I'll also note that in an age of political polarization, where facts are often twisted or ignored, that good and reliable data, I believe, is more important than ever. Um, it was mentioned when I first came into office, I, I wanted to really open up the doors, the windows, the skylights of the city's finances and much more for everybody to see. And I launched Control Panel LA, which was the city's first open data site. Now, nine years ago, when I came into office, there was no open data site. Uh, actually, my office had lots of fax machines and no Wi-Fi, which was horrifying to me when I came into office. We changed that very quickly, of course. And uh, we were told that in creating the first data portal, it was going to be very expensive. It was going to be a long process. 
And actually that turned out not to be the case, at least for the first iteration of it, uh, when we uh, created a partnership with Socrata, which has since grown exponentially. And we began with financial data, but we greatly expanded it. And so Control Panel LA, and if you go to lacontroller.org, you'll find that is the definitive source for machine readable interactive data about finances, payroll, revenues, performance, and much more. We've got a payroll explorer. We've got the virtual checkbook of the city. We've got applications to allow residents to easily monitor how that money is being spent. Because while my title is controller, the reality is it's impossible to control everything. But when you put it out there for everybody to see, other people are able to also be uh, part and partnership of that role of being watchdogs of your money. Now, I really believe in bringing data to life and we go beyond just collecting and publishing data. And uh, we do it with data analysis, with visualizations, trying to really bring this to life. And by the way, making it colorful, making it fun, making it interesting so that people actually get engaged in it and using all sorts of metrics. Uh, we've created dashboards and infographics and videos and maps and data stories, all sorts of interactive online tools to also provide some context for all of that data. Um, some of the uh, most recent uh, features that we have include, uh, we did a map of every single one of the food pantries, uh, not just in Los Angeles, but throughout the state. By the way, I'll note that we did that during COVID. It quickly became the number one visited feature of my website, which tells me an awful lot about the level of food insecurity and how much uh, it is important to get that information out to people who need it. Um, we updated our city finances dashboard with real-time insights into the financial health of the city, tracking our general fund, our reserve funds, all of our many hundreds of funds, what's going in, what's going out, our debt ratio spending, and much more. Um, I also mapped every single one of the properties owned by the city. Uh, by the way, the city of LA is the largest owner of properties within Los Angeles. Uh, we own more parcels than anybody else. Um, this has become really uh, crucial for me um, in that when you look at the crisis that we have of homelessness, I believe the least we can do is be looking at properties that we own as a city government, uh, be it for uh, permanent housing or be it for uh, bridge housing or be it even for other kinds of places where we can temporarily help to get people off the street and into better shape and couple that, of course, with much needed social services. Um, we've done also mapping of illegal dumping of all of the oil wells in Los Angeles, what's in your backyard, uh, of sidewalk repairs, of affordable housing, and much, much more. And, and also we uh, really pioneered the equity index. You heard a little bit about how that is uh, morphing into more now uh, within the city, but it's an interactive tool that you'll find on my website, uh, measuring structural disparities and barriers, uh, measuring uh, socioeconomic factors, access to resources, educational attainment, environmental hazards, and much, much more. And I'm really looking forward to seeing this over time used as an actual tool in terms of how money gets distributed in the city so that we do a much more equitable job of it. You know, tough times bring new opportunities um, and COVID-19, which of course we've been living with for uh, almost two and a half years, shockingly, um, has been a tough time, but also has provided new opportunities in terms of how we use data uh, in my office, we created a resource hub uh, with all sorts of hundreds of resources to connect people, uh, but also tracking the virus and a breakdown for every neighborhood, race, ethnicity, gender, age. We did the same for vaccine implementation so that people could see the disparities and so that the city could actually act on them. Um, and you'll also find on my site tracking every single dollar, uh, well more than a billion dollars, uh, and exactly where it went that was related to COVID. How much of it went to PPE, how much of it went to overtime, how much of it went to contractor A and B and C and much, much more. And these are just a few highlights of how we're uh, employing data. And it's evolving daily, of course. And I believe that the opportunities are limited. Uh, really, nobody was talking about open data uh, nine, 10 years ago. And so we've come a long way since then. Um, but of course, not all the data is in one place or in one system, and that continues 
to provide a lot of challenges. And a huge collection doesn't come without its trade-offs. Uh, our city in many ways is watching us, each and every single one of us, with license plate scanners, with cameras, with data about our businesses, data gathered in issuing hundreds of types of licenses and permits, very sensitive data that is gathered by our paramedics, by our police department, by every department in our uh, city, any county and, and many levels of government. Uh, actually, I issued a, a report on this about a year ago uh, that really kind of took a look at all this kind of data that's being gathered about us and how can we use it for good and make sure that it's not being misused uh, because there are unfortunately opportunities for that as well. So data like everything else can be used for good and we have to be careful to make sure that that is in fact happening. Um, as a data geek, it is really exciting to be among all of you again this year and to be doing it in person, isn't that great? Uh, and to really uh, be able to share our mutual enthusiasm for data and for technology. I'll close out by saying that the Office of the Controller has some great opportunities for employment, for internships, and more for those who are interested in data and doing good with it. And uh, please check us out again at lacontroller.org. You'll find a uh, whole bunch of information about the available opportunities. I'll say that together, I really believe that we can transform our communities and our future with data and with how we use it. So thank you again for having me, and I wish you all a great time today. And before I get off the stage, uh, I've got a number of uh, certificates of recognition from the city of Los Angeles, which I'm happy to hand out. Uh, one is uh, for the USC Marshall School of Business. So um, somebody wants to come up and uh, uh, accept it. I'm just gonna read a small little part of this. And uh, it, among other things, it says that the school, as we all know, is an integral part of the LA landscape and really uh, has done an amazing job uh, in Los Angeles and internationally, uh, continues to expand. Uh, we're so grateful for uh, your uh, involvement with uh, DataCon, but so much more. And so uh, here is one of these handy dandy certificates from the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> Congratulations. And, and then also, uh, there is a whole bunch of certificates of appreciation for the wonderful volunteers. Uh, and uh, I, I won't read the whole certificate, but uh, there is a list here of folks that uh, is going to be read. Please, I want to invite you to come up and uh, engage in the uh, paparazzi extravaganza. All right, so we have um, Cal, Cal Todorov. Um, and then uh, Rich Ung. Sanjeev Segal. Bob Neustadt. Eli Salkin, Ozzy Darula, Ruben Barrios, Nancy Malucci, Robbie Smith, Arti Anaswamy, Jermaine Louis. Michelle Amel, Ritesh Dedia, and our host, Dima Soprato.
All right, so as we close this keynote session, we want to thank our sponsors, USC, Boomi, Interest, Interest Cluster, MongoDB, and StarRox. Please visit their booths and get your passport stamped to qualify to win an Amazon Echo today. So you don't want to miss that. Get your passport. We have friendly volunteers wearing this t-shirt around the campus to help you find your way around. And don't hesitate to reach out to them if you have any concerns. Bob and I are signing off. Thank you very much. We hope you gain, you, we hope you gain something useful today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.